Well, hello and welcome to Movement Church Online. I'm Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here at Movement Church, and I just want to say Happy Easter to you today. We're so glad and so honored that you would make the decision to join us on this Easter Sunday or this Easter week whenever you're catching up with us. We're so glad that you're joining us together, joining with us today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Now, today I want to ask you to do two things. We're going to we're going to spend some time looking at the Easter story, reading what, about what God did through Jesus on the cross and with the empty grave, celebrating the Easter story celebrating what God has done for all of us. And we're going to spend some time together singing some songs of worship. But what I'd love to ask you to do today is to do two things. Number one, I'd love for you to hit the comments right now and let us know where you're watching from so we can say hey and so we can let you know, so, so we can just you know wish you a happy Easter from wherever you're watching from. But I also would love if you think this content is helpful or if you think there's someone that you know that should hear this or that would, that would, that would enjoy this, that would be moved by this, we would love for you to share this right now so that people can hear this message, so that people can be can, can know the message of, of Easter that God loves and is God, God has brought forgiveness and new life for them. So we would love for you to share this right now. Love for you to comment. Love for you to keep engaged throughout the message and through the worship. Let us know what you're enjoying. Let us know what you're learning. We'd love to hear from you. So without any further ado, let's jump into the message today for Easter 2022 at Movement Church Online. Well, happy Easter to you, and spoiler alert, if in case you're not that familiar with the Easter story, why we celebrate Easter, today we celebrate the death and the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Most importantly, the resurrection, the greatest event in human history. We celebrate that Jesus died on the cross and was buried in a grave, and then he rose from the grave and was seen by over 500 people. And one of my favorite things to do as a preacher and as a pastor as we celebrate Easter is actually to look back to the Old Testament to zoom in on certain stories throughout the history of God's interaction with his people because in so many of these amazing stories, so many of these actual true stories from the Old Testament, what we see is that God did what authors of amazing stories do so well and so often. He foreshadowed the main event. He foreshadowed the main event. He foreshadowed what Jesus would eventually do with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And I think that's important because it reminds us of an incredible, incredible truth. Salvation through the cross and the empty grave was God's plan from the beginning. Salvation through the cross and the empty grave was God's plan from the very beginning. Easter was not a one-off moment of mercy from God. It was the plan all along. Salvation wasn't a good idea God came up with partway through the story. It was the story from the start. And as so many great authors do, God was so excited about the story of salvation that at pivotal moments in the story of his people, God amplified elements in their stories that would one day unfold to reveal the story that God was ultimately telling. There's beautiful stories all throughout the Old Testament that foreshadow what God would ultimately do through Jesus on the cross and through the empty grave. So the story that we're going to zoom into today is a beautiful example of this foreshadowing of the main thing that God would ultimately and eventually do through Jesus. See, after the nation of Israel left Egypt, God brought them to Mount Sinai where Moses and the nation received the law. Then for 40 years, they would wander and travel throughout the Sinai wilderness. This story takes place during that those wandering years. In Numbers chapter 21, here's what we're told. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. 
There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. Now, here's what we have to notice. Israel finds itself impatient with God and rebelling against God. Here's what we see in them. They are impatient, they are rebellious, and they are dissatisfied. They're impatient, they're rebellious, and they're dissatisfied. They're impatient, they're saying, we're making progress, but it is not happening fast enough. We're supposed to be there already. We should have moved further along the road by now. Why is it taking so long? They're impatient with what God is doing and where God is leading them, the pace that God is moving at. They're rebellious. This is beyond just simple complaint. This is complaint plus God's way is dumb and wrong. We do not trust God. We want to take things into our own hands and do things our way because God's way is not getting us where we want to go. It's not getting us what we want to get. It's not moving us fast enough. God's way is not working. We need to take it into our own hands. And they're dissatisfied, meaning that God's provision is no longer good enough for them. The manna, which they once viewed as the blessing of God, now they say this is horrible. This is horrible. They are impatient, they are rebellious, and they are dissatisfied. And let me just ask you this question. Does that sound like anyone you know? It sounds like all of us, right? This is why we sin against God. This is why we rebe- this is why we, we get impatient. We get rebellious. We think we have we have a better way. We get dissatisfied with what God is doing. With, that God is is moving us, but He's not moving us fast enough. He's blessing us, but it's the same blessing, not a new blessing. We get dissatisfied, and so we turn our backs and we turn away from God. And here's what we're told happens in Numbers chapter 21. So the Lord, so the Lord, as a result of what happened previously, what was going on, the Lord decided to act. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Now, we can laugh about that because it sounds a little silly. I promise you no one in the nation of Israel is laughing. Most trans- translations actually call these poisonous snakes, they call them fiery serpents, indicating that there was a fever caused by their bites. We're told this, Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned. We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. See, the people knew immediately that there was a direct connection between their sin and the snakes. That their sin and the snakes had a direct connection. They knew the snakes were the consequences of their grumbling, of their complaining, of their impatience, of their rebellion against God. But with that awareness, there's something I think we should address. See, the consequence of their sin, their impatience, their rebellion, their dissatisfaction, it seems like too much, doesn't it? Like it it seems like God has taken it a little bit too far. They complain, so they get snakes? I mean, like they complain, so they get snakes. This does not seem like a proportional response from God for complaint against God. See, as a person who hates snakes, this seems like this would be a terrible punishment, like too far of a punishment for anything. Like no matter what you've done, you don't deserve snakes. This is a strong reminder for us. This is something that God wanted to put on display. The consequence of sin is always greater than we realize. The consequence of sin is always greater than we realize. It is. See, what we think, we think that small sin has small consequence and understandably big sin has big consequence. We think sin and consequence should be fair, that the punishment should fit the crime. But God took this moment in the life of the nation of Israel to remind us of this incredibly important truth. Sin is not fair. Sin is a killer. Sin is not fair. Sin is a killer. See, sin has a natural consequence. It kills everything and everyone that it touches. It does. Sin kills you and it kills me when we touch it. So when you tell a lie, trust dies. Something always dies when we, when we tell, when we, when we choose sin. When you cut a corner for convenience at work, your credibility dies. When you gossip, someone's reputation dies. Every time we touch or get involved in sin, something dies. And every time we sin against God, we rebel against God, we get impatient with God, we call bad what God has called good, our relationship with God dies. Sin is not fair. Sin kills. Sin is not fair. Sin is deadly. The consequence of our sin is always greater than we think it is because sin is not fair. Sin is deadly. 
sin's consequence is always greater than we realize. The story goes on to tell us this. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. See, in our thinking, this is ridiculous, right? This is not a cure. This is not, this is not medically satisfying. This is ridiculous. With all of our medical advances, with all, with all our knowledge, the, the, the idea that someone should make a statue and have people look at it and that will bring healing, that's a ridiculous idea. It's an absurd idea. I mean, God, why would you not tell them where to find a particular root or flower that can cure this type of snake bite? Why would you show them where to get water and rest and get out of the sun so that their fevers doesn't kill them? Why would you not have Moses kill a snake and make an anti-venom. I give give the cure in a way that makes sense. Why not develop medicine? Why not require them to work for a cure? It would have given them all something to do and it would have satisfied every natural instinct at the heart of the heart to work on behalf of our own cure. And in that, in that, I think we learned something about what God wanted to do and how God wants to bring our healing. God's plan required nothing from them but trust in Him. God's plan required nothing from them but trust in Him. The fact that they were not told to make a human remedy is God's attempt to reinforce the greater fact that there is no human remedy for sin. There is no human remedy for sin. There is only God's remedies for sin. Nothing but death awaited them unless God provided a remedy. But obedience to God's instruction would bring more healing in a moment than all of their human effort combined. And so as we look to this story, just to be very clear, as we as we set up a, a, a moment of foreshadowing for what God would ultimately do through Jesus on the cross and the empty grave, here is God's solution at this moment for their problem of the snakes, for their problem of what they have been bitten by, to provide healing for a nation where there seems to be no solution. Here is God's solution to their problem. You must look at the thing that bit you, What is hung on the pole no longer has the power to kill you, and healing comes because of your trust in God's solution. Let me just read that again. You must look at the thing that bit you. You must be confronted by the thing that bit you. You make a replica of the snake so that what bit you is hung in front of you. You must look at the thing that bit you. What is hung on the pole no longer has the power to kill you. You must look at the snake to know that the snake no longer has any power over you. And healing comes not because of a remedy that you have come up with, but healing comes because of your trust in God's solution. Now, do you see the foreshadowing of what would eventually take place through Jesus on the cross? This was 1,500 years before Jesus would walk the earth. And 1,500 years after this event, we find Jesus walking the earth. And as Jesus would walk the earth, he would commonly get questions from people who were wondering about who he was and what he was ultimately up to. People who recognized his power, recognized his authority, recognized that there was something special about him and wondered, what are you ultimately here to accomplish? One of the people that asked these types of questions was a man named Nicodemus. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you've read his story. Nicodemus was a religious leader. He were told that he was set, that he sat on the on the court of rulers of the nation of Israel, which means that he had some authority. Which means that he was an expert in the law. Which means that he, when people, when he spoke, people listened. And when he asks questions, someone has to answer. And he comes to Jesus and he says, "Jesus, I recognize because of your miracles and because of the signs that you have performed that." That you have come from God. And I need to know, what are you here to accomplish? What are you here to do? It is obvious that you are from, that you've come from God. What are you here to accomplish? And this begins a conversation where Jesus tells Nicodemus that I have come, that men can be born again, and everyone must be born again to see the Father. And Nicodemus wonders what that's all about and how that could even be possible. How can a person even be be born again? How is it possible that a person can be made right with God by being born again? And after this long back and forth and this long conversation, Jesus drops this nugget that references the story that we have just read as he begins to explain to Nicodemus how a person can actually be born 
again in John chapter three, starting in verse 13, we're told this. Jesus said, no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the son of man has come down from heaven. And as Moses, and as Moses, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the son of man, Jesus' own title for himself, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Let me read verse 14 and 15 again. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. As so, as so, as so, as then, so now. The plan now and for all of time is the same as the plan back then. And here is God's plan for our healing, for our salvation, for the problem of our sin. How we're born again. How we're born again without sin. How we become new. How we're made whole. How we're made free. Here is God's plan that would ultimately be worked out through Jesus. That Jesus explained years before he would go to the cross. It's simply this. That you must look at the thing that bit you. What is hung on the pole no longer has the power to kill you. And salvation comes through your trust in God's solution. Once again, you must look at the thing that bit you. What is hung on the pole no longer has the power to kill you. And salvation comes through your trust in God's solution. Let me begin to break this down a little bit. The first one, you must look at the thing that bit you. When Paul tried to explain to the church in Corinth what, G- what God had done through Jesus on the cross, here's what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. See, it was not just Jesus lifted up on the cross. Jesus was lifted up so your sin could be lifted up. We're told that God took our sin and he placed our sin on Jesus so that when Jesus was lifted up, our sin was lifted up. Jesus took your sin on his head, chest, shoulders, side, hands, and feet. The cross reminds us of the weight of our sins. When we look at the thing that bit us, we look at Jesus, we look at our sin, just as the people had to look at the, at the image of the snake, we need to look at our sin to be reminded of the weight of our sin, that our sin was so bad that someone perfect had to die in our place in order for us to gain right standing with God. We need to be reminded of the weight of our sin, reminded of the weight of our sin so that we never go back there again, so that we never attempt to to take it off the cross and pick it up again and bring it back to life. We need to be reminded of the weight of our sin, but also we need to look at it to be reminded of the goodness of God, that God would take our sin and place it on his perfect son so that our sin would die with him. That's an unbelievable truth. We need to be reminded of the weight of our sin so that we can be reminded of the goodness of God, that through Jesus, our sins are forgiven. And this is good news to you today. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. We need to look at what bit us. And sin has bitten every one of us. That's why God took our sin and placed it on Jesus. So that through his death, which was not because of his sin, but was in place of our sin, we could be reminded of the weight of sin and of the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God, which purchased the forgiveness of your sin and mine. Not only do we need to be reminded of the weight of our sin, we need to be reminded that our sin is no longer alive because we all need to be reminded that what is hung on the cross no longer has the power to kill you. See, I have said this on a number of occasions, but maybe today we can hear it better than we've ever heard it before in light of what we're celebrating today. When Jesus died more than Jesus died, sin died. 
sin died. Your reliance on substances died. Your addiction to pornography died. Your difficulty telling with the truth and the ease with which you tell lies died. Your broken relationship habits that keep pursuing relationships with toxic people despite all of the red flags, it died. Everything that has brought, that has broken you, everything that has broken your relationship with God, everything that has brought wreckage in your life, it all died with Jesus. It all died with Jesus. This is why it's so important what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus did not just come to die so that you could be forgiven from your sins. It's even better than that. Jesus came to free you from the power and from the bondage of sin. And we need to be reminded as the people in the wilderness were reminded that what is hung on the cross is dead and it no longer has any power to harm or to kill you. You have been set free by Jesus's death on the cross. He bought the forgiveness of your sins with his blood on the cross, and he broke the power of sin with his death on the cross. He did that for you, and he did that for me, and because he did that for you and for me, what is hung on the cross, our sin, no longer has the power to harm you, no longer has the power to kill you, no longer has the power to separate you from God, because you are, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And then finally, one last thing that we need to be reminded is that salvation comes through your trust in God's solution. That salvation comes through your trust in God's solution. See, Paul wrote that at the cross, God placed our sin on Jesus, but he also did something else. He did something that's even more amazing. He placed Jesus's righteousness on us. Same verse, the second half of it. We say, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, Jesus took my sin upon himself and my sin died on the cross with Jesus. That's amazing. But even more amazing is that because of Jesus' death, I receive Jesus' righteousness and I stand before God pure, holy, and in right standing with our Heavenly Father. And this is what we need to be reminded of today. Your ability to be right with God is all and always about your response to Jesus. Your ability to be right with God is all and always about your response to Jesus. What He has done for you, what He has made you, only Jesus can make you forgiven. Only Jesus can make you whole. Only Jesus can make you pure. Only Jesus can make you new. Only Jesus can make you healed. Only Jesus can give you a right relationship with God. Only Jesus can do that. And that's why your ability to be right with God is all and always about your response to Jesus. So Jesus put it this way to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Notice what Jesus says. Everyone who believes, everyone who trusts, everyone who trusts God's plan for salvation, not everyone who tries harder, not everyone who worked harder, not everyone who became a better person, not everyone who's trying to live their best life now. Those are all our solutions. Those are our solutions and our attempts to fix the brokenness of our sin. Those are the human solutions to the problem of our sin. Try harder, restrain your urges more, be a better person, all good things, but they don't address the problem. See, in the wilderness and at the cross, the question was always the same. Will you look to your solutions or God's solution? Will you look to your solutions or to God's solutions? Will you look to man's solutions or will you trust in God's solution for the problem of your sin? Will you try harder? Will you try to make more money? Will you try to get everything that you think you should have? Will you try to make sure that your relationships work better because you're gonna work harder at them? Or will you simply trust God's solution? solution that was made available through Jesus on the cross. Will you take a look at the thing that bit you, which is your sin? Will you trust that because of Jesus' death on the cross, 
It has no longer, what is hung on the cross, your sin, no longer has the power to harm or to kill you. And will you trust in God's solution made available through Jesus and through God's plan? And here was God's ultimate solution. In John chapter 20, we're told this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. Seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what the, that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. See, here's the beautiful news of Easter. The story does not end with Jesus' death on the cross. The story begins and brings new life for all of us with Jesus walking out of an empty grave with resurrection life for you and for me and for everyone everywhere for all of time. See, God's plan of salvation was not only that sin would die, but that all would be raised to new life with Jesus. That all, that all, including you, could be raised to new life with Jesus. Because of Jesus, because of Easter, because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, here's what is available to you. Here's God's plan for you. Here's what God hopes you will receive today. Because of Jesus, you are forgiven of sin. Because of Jesus, you are freed from sin. And because of Jesus, you can experience new life in Him. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the good news for everyone, everywhere, all of time. And it's good news for you today. That whatever sin you have been living in, you are forgiven of it when your trust is in Jesus. Whatever sin has been wrecking your life, you are freed from it in Jesus when you trust in Jesus. And because of Jesus, you can find new life because he walked out of an empty grave with resurrection power and resurrection life for you when you when you trust in him and when you follow him you are forgiven of your sin your sin is no longer held against you your sin is no longer held against you by god sin can no longer separate you from god because you are forgiven because of jesus's work on the cross you are freed from your sin your sin no longer has any power over you it no longer has the power to hurt you no longer has the power to destroy you no longer has the power to kill you because jesus went to the cross and died with your sin Sin has been dealt with once and for all. You are freed from your sin and you can experience new life in him. You can be made new in an instant when you trust and identify with Jesus' resurrection life and receive his resurrection power. That is what we celebrate at Easter. That's what God foreshadowed 1,500 years before Jesus' arrival on the earth. It's been the plan all along that sin would one day be dealt with, that we would be freed from sin and that we could be raised to new life in him. That's Easter. That's why we celebrate. That's what we rejoice in is the, the, the death of our sin, the death of death, and the raising of new, to new life for everyone, everywhere, for all time that is available through Jesus. That's what you can celebrate today if your trust is in Jesus. And that's what you can choose to embrace today if you have never done that. And if you've never done that, 
right now, I would like to extend an invitation to you. We have, we have a, a link in, in the description of this video where you can let us know if you would like to make a decision to follow Jesus. But for some of you today, today is your day to make a decision to follow Jesus, to receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the freedom and the new life that Jesus won for you between Good Friday and Easter. That Jesus won for you with his death on the cross and with his resurrection from the grave. His death on the cross, it bought forgiveness for you. It bought freedom from you, for you. And his resurrection, it brought new life for you. And if you'd like to receive that today, today in a moment, I'm gonna pray. And I would encourage you in this moment to speak to your heavenly father, to let him know that you're accepting his grace, that you're accepting his mercy, that you're accepting his forgiveness, and that you also wanna receive his new life that Jesus won for you. That's how, that's, this would be the greatest decision that you could make this Easter. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you so much for what Jesus won when he came out of the grave. Thank you that at the cross, he bought the forgiveness and the freedom from our sin. God, because of our sin, we're separated from you. But because of Jesus, we no longer have to be separated from you. We can experience forgiveness and freedom that he won at the cross. And God, thank you that because of Jesus' resurrection, which we celebrate today, thank you that we can be made new, we can be made whole, and we can be brought back to life with you. Thank you for what you did through Jesus. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his new life that we all want to follow in. We love you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't just tolerate us. You don't have somewhere to go. We're not your trophy children you abandon when we roam. Your mercy's not a favor, and your presence isn't rushed. Oh no, our God is love. The cross was not a vehicle for you to finally care. When we look upon your character, your grace was always there. Acceptance not withheld from us, no need to measure up. Oh no, our God is love. Let's sing, his arms are open. His arms are open for all to gather here the cross says spoken there's nothing left to fear once and for all he showed how far his grace would go for us our god is love he is he is he is he is and how vast the father heart for us will never reach the end I thought for sure I found it but he proved me wrong again so much higher so much wider so much deeper than we know
sing as if God has actually gone to the cross and won a victory for us that we couldn't win for ourselves. And that's how we know his love. And that's how we know his goodness. And that's how we know his mercy and his grace. Let's sing this together. He's overcoming it.
faithfulness. You never break your promises. You are good, always good, my Jesus. In the tension of the night, you speak your word, my guiding light. I will trust, I will trust you, Jesus. Come on, let's lift it up. We'll sing your praise your name. I praise your name in every moment I will choose to say with all strength when the day gets hard. Be my hope, you're my hope, King Jesus. Whoa, I praise your name. In every moment I will choose to say, with all I am, with every breath I take, I praise your shadow in the sunlight it's my joy for my whole life to praise your name let's we'll sing it again in the good and the bad times in the shadow in the sunlight it's my joy for my whole life to praise your name shadow in the sunlight it's my joy for my whole life to praise your name Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us for Easter at Movement Church Online. Hope you've been blessed. Hope you've been encouraged. Hope you've been challenged. Hope that you're able to take a step as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, we want to let you know a few things if you want to engage with our church for, uh, moving forward. If you want to give today, we want to let you know the ways that you can give. They're on the screen right now. You can give with a text. You can give online. You can give to our cash app, or you can send a physical donation to the P.O. box that's on screen right now. But however and whenever you choose to give, I really do want to say thank you so much for your generosity generosity to our church. Thank you for your faithfulness to God. When you give, you make ministry possible. And so we really want to say thank you so much for your generosity. We also want to let you know if you have a need, we would love to hear from you so that we can pray for you and so that we can consider how we can meet your needs. So the ways you can let us know are on screen. You can give us a call. You can shoot us a text. You can shoot us a message or an email. We would love to hear from you so that we know how we can pray for you and how we can pastor you and how we can minister to you. And then finally, we want to remind you that our kids' experiences are online every Sunday at 10 a.m. and then on demand all week long as long as there's an internet. So thank you so much for checking those out as a family. We think they're an incredible addition to our to our online experience for, for, our, for our church online. We think they're great for families and they're great for whether you're part of our in-person or online family to keep checking out, keep growing in your kids' faith. So we want to say happy Easter once again. Thank you so much for joining us. And until we see you next week, keep being the movement.